Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Throughout the course of history, there have been hundreds, if not millions, of movies made about monkeys. But nobody has ever taken the time to sit down and rank every single one of them. Until now. What's the best monkey movie ever made? What's the worst one? Who is the best monkey actor ever put to film? These are the questions I will answer using my brand new invention. The Monkey Box. Holy shit, boys! We're back! That's right! It's finally time for The Monkey Box Episode 2! And boy howdy, it's been a hot minute since the first episode, and a lot has changed. Most notably, this show is no longer officially on YouTube since we got completely fucking banned. Now you might think that's a bad thing, but it's actually a blessing in disguise. Now that we aren't a YouTube show anymore, we aren't restricted by their rules. In fact, we aren't restricted by any rules. There are no rules. Um, what are the, uh, rules? There's only one rule. Are you ready? Here it is. There are no rules. Go! We can do or say anything we want. Which means I can finally say what I truly feel about Steve Harvey without fear of receiving any strikes for hate speech. So here we go. Steve Harvey is a Nice man! And I'm sick and tired of the racist comments you degenerate scumbags keep making about him. You fuckers even went and defaced Wikipedia pages to push your racist narrative that Steve Harvey is somehow a monkey. Such racial epithets are absolutely disgusting and have no place in the modern day. You should all be deeply ashamed of yourselves. All right, you bleeding heart monkey lovers, let's get down to business. And it turns out we've got some unfinished business from the last episode. In case you don't remember how this show works, I put the name of every monkey movie ever made into this here monkey box, and every episode I randomly choose three movies and then review and rank them. However, in the first episode, we drew a movie called Animal Behavior. And according to the trailer, it featured the funniest chimp that ever hit the silver screen. And move over, Bonzo, because here comes Mike, the funniest chimp that ever hit the silver screen. Animal behavior. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the movie anywhere. It wasn't available for streaming and it never had a DVD release, so I was heartbroken and I had no choice but to skip it. All hope seemed lost. But then a brave hero named Julius Von Brunk showed up in person to my New York City live recording of Boomer vs. Zoomer. And this beautiful motherfucker handed me a VHS copy of the film along with a digital rip. So now, for the first and probably last time ever, we actually have a physical copy of a monkey box movie! Julius actually has a YouTube channel of his own, so if you could go to his channel and thank him for doing this, I'd really appreciate that. I've got a link to his channel down in the description. And now, without further ado, let's check out Animal Behavior. Animal Behavior is a 1989 romantic comedy with a bit of a bizarre history. Especially coupled with the fact that this film is now virtually unwatchable unless you purchase a 30-year-old copy of the VHS on eBay. It seems as though whoever made this movie legitimately wanted it to disappear from the face of the earth. In fact, it was almost never completed.
Most of the film was shot in 1984, five years before its eventual release. But production stopped dead in its tracks when one of the supporting actresses of the film, Alexa Kennan, stopped dead in her tracks literally when she was found dead in her New York apartment at age 23. And apparently, even to this day, her cause of death is unknown. That's some fishy fucking flounder if you ask me. How in the fuck does somebody die alone in their apartment at age 23 and no investigators can figure out a cause of death? It seems to me like somebody doesn't want the truth getting out. And now it's been so long that nobody even remembers who the fuck Alexa Cannon was. But don't worry Alexa, your death will not have been in vain. Monkey Jones is on the case. And I have a theory that Alexa's death ties directly into this, her final film, Animal Behavior. Because after Alexa died, the director of the film, Jenny Bowen, essentially abandoned the project, and a producer stepped in to slowly film the unfinished scenes over the course of the next four years. Could it be that director Jenny Bowen realized her film was such a stinky piece of shit that it would tank her career if it was ever released. So she did the unthinkable and murdered a young supporting actress so that the film would be canceled. Or maybe, just maybe, could one of the film's producers have been engaged in a sexual relationship with the young starlet, and poor Alexa Kennan threatened to go public with this inappropriate sexual affair, giving the producer no choice but to have her eternally silenced? It's possible, but who could this suspected producer be? Oh, the film was produced by Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yeah, okay, case closed. But dead actress Schmedschmactress, nobody gives a fuck. What you're really here for is the monkey. And the trailer promised that this monkey is the funniest monkey to ever be featured in a film. So let's get into our criteria. Here at the Monkey Box, we score films based on three criteria, monkey hijinks, monkey performance, and overall movie quality. So let's hop into the first one. All right, folks, if the movie trailer is going to make the bold claim that this is the funniest monkey in any movie ever, then there better be some top-notch monkey hijinks. This monkey better get into comical mischief so uproariously hilarious that my dick explodes. And it does nothing. The monkey does nothing. The film is about a biologist and a musician who fall in love, and the monkey is just sort of there. Karen Allen's character is researching language acquisition by teaching sign language to Mike the monkey. So we have scenes of Mike doing sign language, and sometimes he's acting out like a normal monkey would, and sometimes he's retrieving balls and shit. But it's not really up to the monkey hijink standards that the trailer would lead one to believe. In fact, I would argue that Karen Allen gets into way more monkey hijinks than the monkey she's researching. This bitch backs her car into somebody else's car and then leaves it running with the lights on. She spills food all over and loses her balance like a goddamn rag doll. She does the Wakanda forever gesture. These are the sort of things the monkey should be doing, not the human. Most of the time the monkey is just sitting around doing nothing. Like here in this scene where he's holding hands with a little girl. Wait, could this be? Is this the prequel to Max Mata Moore? Jesus fucking Christ, she's only like six! This is fucked up! So in terms of monkey hijinks, I give Karen Allen a 5 out of 10. But I give Mike the Monkey a score of 2 out of 10. Certainly not the funniest monkey to grace the silver screen. But was his performance any good? Let's take a look. First and foremost, 
I've got to say how fucking excited I am that for the first time, we actually have a real fucking monkey on screen! It's not Steve Harvey's stepson or some dumb shit! It's an actual real-life monkey performer! So, Mike the Monkey is already the best monkey performance we've seen thus far, just because he's the only monkey performance we've seen thus far. Now, even though Mike isn't given much to do in terms of wacky shenanigans, he still gives a pretty decent performance as far as monkey performances go. It's hard to tell if the monkey is actually acting or not, because a lot of the time he's behaving so authentically, as any monkey would, that it feels as if they just pointed a camera at him and filmed random b-roll while he wasn't paying attention. Again, it does feel authentic, but it's not really much of a performance. But other times, Mike actually performs some basic tricks during long takes. And in my mind, the most impressive animal performances are the ones done during long takes. Anybody could use fancy editing and cuts to make it look like a monkey is doing something. So I really appreciate it when we watch a monkey perform a task all in one take. For example, we have a decently long take where Mike is being romantic with his six-year-old girlfriend, and then he retrieves and throws a ball after being commanded to. Michael, where is the ball? Where is the ball? Is it in the chest? Get me the chest. It's not super impressive, but you can tell the monkey was in the zone and knew exactly what he had to do for the scene. But ultimately, there's nothing that really blew me away. For the most part, it was just a monkey acting like a monkey, which is to be expected, but isn't to be praised as extraordinary. Which is why, in terms of monkey performance, I'm gonna give this one 5 out of 10 bananas. Alright, we've established that the monkey was underwhelming and the trailer was deceptive. But was the movie itself any good? I've been waiting for literally four months to see this movie. Stewing in anxious anticipation. Feeling the hype build within me. And now it's time to answer the age-old question. Did it live up to the hype? No. The movie is pretty fucking dog shit. In fact, it was so dull that I wouldn't be surprised if Alexa Kennan actually committed suicide out of shame for being involved in the project. First of all, it's a comedy film that isn't funny. Which is surprising, because the film was written and directed by women, and they're known for their great sense of humor. It's also strange that in a lot of ways this film seems to have been created through a male lens, like sort of a male fantasy, even though it was written and directed by women. The protagonist of the film is a music professor named Mark, and every woman wants to fuck him. He has a sexy young student who wants to fuck him after class, at his house, in the booth of a bar, she's all over him. By the way, this is Alexa Kennan, in case you were wondering. It seems that the only woman who doesn't want Mark's cock is Karen Allen, and she only doesn't want it because she's too focused on the monkey's cock. But then at the end of the film, she wants Mark's cock too. So let's see. It's a film written and directed by women about an older man who is lusted after by young, attractive women because of the power dynamics in their relationship. I wonder who could have influenced this creative choice. Oh, right, it was produced by Harvey Weinstein. But the film isn't just an unfunny comedy. It's also an awkward romance. The conflict of the film is that Mark wants to fuck Karen Allen, but Karen Allen is too obsessed with her monkey research, and then eventually, when Karen Allen wants to fuck Mark back, she mistakes Mark's neighbor for his wife and assumes he's a married man. So we've got a simple misunderstanding that propels the story. This typically works for short narratives like an episode of Friends, but stretched over the course of a 90 minute film, it becomes completely dull and repetitive. And just frankly frustrating. 
Look at his hands, you dumb bitch! He don't have a ring! The romance scenes are kind of ruined because Karen Allen thinks Mark is married, so she can't really embrace the moments because she doesn't want to cross the line. And also the whimsical circumstances you'd expect from a romantic comedy come across as awkward and even perhaps sociopathic? The best example of this is when Mark rescues the monkey from a rock in the middle of a lake, and then Karen Allen comes too, and Mark basically shoves her into the water and doesn't seem apologetic whatsoever about it, and then he just jumps in the water with her, and the way it all played out felt really stiff and uncomfortable. Stay, Michael. It's alright. There we are. No, no, Alex. Oh no, oh no, Michael. Michael, Michael, stay with Mark. Michael. It's not necessary. It's not necessary. Wait, wait, Michael. Everything is under control now. Really, please, I'll just take a minute. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, sorry. Listen, stay. It's freezing. Please. Stay. Here we are. Everybody, everybody stay calm. Here. Take my, take my hand. Hand. It's cold. Cold. Oh, my God. Oh, well, he's, he's not going anywhere. Despite being the most hyped movie in Monkey Box history, Animal Behavior is one of the dullest, most forgettable movies I'll probably ever see. And not even a cute little monkey could redeem it. It's actually a good thing that this movie is nearly impossible to find and watch these days, because it reduces the risk of anybody wasting an hour and a half of their time watching this shit. In terms of overall movie quality, I give this one a 3 out of 10. The greatest tragedy of all is that they let this film be released posthumously for Alexa Cannon, thus tarnishing her legacy when it should have stayed dead and buried like her. And that gives Animal Behavior a final score of 10 out of 30, earning it a third place ranking on the board. Which means it's finally time to return to the Monkey Bar. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Junkie Moans. You may remember me from such classic films as Monkey Jones Stops the School Shooting and Boring Twitch Livestream Number 8. Today, I'm here to tell you about this episode's sponsor, Patreon.com slash Monkey. Listen, my celebrity lifestyle doesn't come cheap. I've got to pay for bananas, hookers, and lots of cocaine and cocaine accessories. And through the fan support at patreon.com slash monkey, I'm allowed to continue my degenerate behavior. So, if you like the work we do here online, please consider contributing a dollar or two. And if you throw in five dollars a month, you'll get to see videos like this way earlier than everybody else. Fuck the normies. Anyway, it's time for me to go plan my next day of retribution, so I'll catch you playa haters on the flip side. Yeah! <laughs> yes! 
In case you couldn't tell, I was pretty excited about the monkey box bestowing Dunstan checks in upon us. I've never actually seen this movie before, but its reputation precedes itself. There are daily threads on 4chan discussing this legendary film, inquiring whether or not it is Monkino, and generating memes upon memes to honor its legacy. But will the film live up to its reputation, or will it be another horrible disappointment like its monkey box predecessor? Let's take a look. Dunstan Checks In is a 1996 comedy film about a monkey that causes quite the ruckus when he checks into a five-star New York hotel. But Dunstan isn't just here to monkey around, he's actually a jewel thief. Will Dunstan steal all the jewels from the Majestic Hotel? Will Jason Alexander get fired from his job as manager when the hotel owner finds out about this monkey business? Will Dunstan come inside? All this and more in the 90-minute family romp, Dunstan Checks In. Dunstan Checks In is a film filled to the brim with top-notch monkey hijinks. And this is all thanks to the premise. Dunstan isn't just a monkey. He's a jewel thief. A criminal! I think this is the fundamental key in making a great monkey movie. The monkey can't just be a monkey. It has to be so much more. The monkey needs to be doing things that monkeys don't normally do. In animal behavior, the monkey was just a monkey. Boring. In Max Mon Amour, the monkey was cuckolding a man by fucking his wife on the reg! That's fucking awesome! And here, Dunstan is a criminal who gets into monkey mischief while on the job. And folks, what more could you ask for? So let's go down the list of the top-notch monkey hijinks on display in this film. The first time we see Dunstan, his big reveal, is him wearing a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses. Hell yeah. But as if that wasn't cool enough, he then starts smoking a fucking cigarette. Oh fuck yeah. This ain't your daddy's monkey movie. Dunstan is cool. But he's not just a cigarette smoking jewel thief. Dunstan is also a cinephile. And he spends his free time watching Planet of the Apes and clapping. still say you're making a mistake. Doctor, I'd like to kiss you goodbye. All right, but you're so damned ugly. But then, it's time to get down to business. A monkey business. We're talking jewel thieving time. And Dunstan is a master of the craft. He climbs up the side of tall buildings without a care in the world, goes in through the window, collects all the jewels, and then monkeys around in order to trash the place and cover his tracks. He's trying on hats, he goes on a motherfucking panty raid, he destroys the room so well Tommy Wiseau himself would be impressed. But, despite being a thief, Dunstan isn't an evil character. In fact, he's a good boy who didn't do nothing because his owner, Lord Rudledge, is actually forcing Dunstan to commit these crimes under threat of death. And Dunstan knows to take these threats seriously, as Lord Rutledge has already killed Dunstan's brother for disobeying him. <laughs> I'm in no mood for this, Dunstan. Don't do this, Dunstan. You remember what happened to your brother, don't you? Samson liked to play games, didn't he? Mm. And we all remember what happened to Samson. Mm. Poor Dunstan is a victim in all this. He's tortured and abused by his malicious owner and forced into a life of crime. He has faced great loss, having watched his only brother be murdered in cold blood. See, it's not all monkeying around for Dunstan. 
This is a character with depth, with a tragic history, stuck in a horrible situation, desperate for affection. He just needs a warm, loving touch. So he does what any of us would do, and sleeps with Jason Alexander. Wait, what the fuck? What is this? The prequel to Max Monomore? But Dunstan's trauma is too much to handle, and he sometimes acts out in horrific ways. Like when he pushes a child into a hole seemingly to his death. He's also a bit of a sexual predator, like the time when he gave a horny woman a back massage without her consent. What is this? The prequel to Max Monomore? What else does this monkey do? Well, in one scene he wears a fedora, and also in another scene he becomes a monkey bowling ball. <laughs> So as you can tell, Dunstan gets into some crazy shenanigans over the course of the film. And it's all just delightful. Well, except for the abusive relationship stuff. Unless you're into that sort of thing. Based on the films I've seen so far thanks to the monkey box, Dunstan definitely sets the bar for monkey hijinks thus far. They didn't half-ass any of this stuff. They knew from the get-go that they were gonna make a wacky monkey comedy, and they went all in. So, in terms of monkey hijinks, I give Dunstan Checks In a score of 9 out of 10. Part of me wants to give it a perfect score, but I feel like there's gotta be monkey movies out there that do just a little bit more. Maybe if we got some scenes of Dunstan riding a skateboard or piloting a plane, then it could have hit that 10 out of 10. But maybe they're saving that for the sequel. Dunstan checks into the World Trade Center. The role of Dunstan was played by Sam the Orangutan, an experienced actor who had previously starred in films and television shows like Baywatch, The Flintstones, and Planet of the Apes. Wait, Planet of the Apes? But isn't there a scene where Dunstan is watch- Oh, clever movie! That's why you always gotta look up the IMDB on these monkeys. You might learn something that gives you a newfound appreciation for their films. Anyway. Sam the Orangutan is no stranger to performing on camera, and it shows. He not only pulls off all his stunts and choreography, but he manages to emote. Can you believe it? I actually saw appropriate emotional reactions on the face of this fucking monkey during the movie. That's next level monkey acting, folks. That's basically just human acting. Why the fuck aren't monkeys able to be nominated for Oscars? Sam the Orangutan manages to run the gamut of human and monkey emotions. We see him goofing off and having fun. He looks frightened when threatened by his evil owner. He forms a close bond with a metrosexual child. Hell, Paul Rubens, aka Pee Wee Herman, is in this movie, and I would argue Sam gives a better performance than him. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, I really appreciate long shots that really show a monkey doing a variety of things in sequence without any cuts, and this movie doesn't really have anything like that. So I'm hesitant to give it a perfect score. Which is why I'm comfortable saying that in terms of monkey performance, Dunstan Checks In earns a score of 9 out of 10 bananas. I'm just gonna come out and say it. I fucking loved this movie. As I was watching it, I was under the impression that this must be a classic 90s film for the whole family that I had somehow missed out on. Everything about it just felt like a classic movie. The cinematography, the premise, the delightfully devilish antagonist, the fucking George Costanza! So you can imagine my surprise when I later found out this movie was a massive critical and financial flop. On Rotten Tomatoes, it holds a critical consensus of fucking 6%! And it actually lost about $6 million at the box office. I can't believe what I'm fucking seeing. Did I watch a different movie than everyone else? Here I thought I was gonna be preaching to the choir about how amazing this film is, but now it looks like I have to defend it! So let me give you the rundown of all the stuff I loved about this movie. 
The role of Rupert Everett as the ruthless villain Lord Ruthledge is one of the best comedic villain performances in recent memory. I don't like to use phrases like chewing the scenery because it seems like only pretentious faggots say that kind of thing, but I think there's no better way to describe this performance. He goes all in as a conniving, pretentious British royal snob, and every part of his performance, from his mannerisms to his condescending tone, is perfectly polished for comedy's sake. Lord Rutledge sets the bar for a campy evil villain in a family film. And I found myself oftentimes more interested in seeing him on screen than Dunstan himself. Fans of The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody might feel as though this film seems familiar. And I wouldn't be surprised if the show was heavily influenced or inspired by this film. It features a family of two boys and a single parent who live in a hotel. And the two totally radical boys get into mischief by playing pranks and goofing around. The big difference here, though, is that the manager isn't just a Mr. Mosby type. He's also their father, which makes for a more interesting dynamic. Here we see the boys causing a ruckus that threatens their father's livelihood and makes his hotel look bad, but at the end of the day, they eat dinner together and he loves them dearly. So I guess my point is, if you enjoyed watching Zack and Cody back in the day, then you'll probably automatically enjoy this film as well. The film doesn't just rely on monkey-based humor and Rupert Everett's masterful performance for the yucks, however. It features a wide variety of comedy that I enjoyed. Of course, there's the classic joke where old women do things you wouldn't expect, like pulling out a flask of whiskey to pour in her tea, or weird little lines that came out of left field and almost made me bust a gut laughing. The human body can only stand so many centuries of inbreeding. <laughs> or even Jason Alexander fighting a man with kitchen utensils. If you thought the kitchen fight in The Raid 2 was good, just wait until you see this shit. <laughs> So yeah, I fucking love Dunstan Checks In. It's the type of movie that if I would have had it on VHS as a kid, I know I would have watched it over 100 times like I did it with Max Keeble's Big Move, Rat Race, and Big Fat Liar. It's no question, Dunstan Checks In is the best monkey movie I've watched so far, and it's an easy 10 out of 10. If you're ever in need for a fantastic monkey film that anybody can enjoy, Dunstan Checks In should be a no-brainer. Which means Dunstan Checks In earns a final score of 28 out of 30, making it the highest ranking monkey movie on the list by far. Will it ever be topped? Who knows. But I've got a really good feeling that the sequel is gonna be a 30 out of 30. And now, we return to the monkey box for the final time today. What wonders shall it bestow? Okay, I'm gonna be real with you guys, I fucking hated this movie. It was like a living nightmare. I don't know if it's because I watched it immediately after Dunstan so my standards were set pretty high, but man, this movie made me sick to my stomach, and I'm not even entirely sure why. But perhaps we'll have a moment of self-discovery as we dive into this film. 
Going Ape is a 1981 comedy film that I was very, very fucking excited to see starred Danny DeVito in a supporting role. I'm pretty sure anybody with a brain in their head is a big fan of Danny DeVito like I am, especially just from his role in It's Always Sunny. You gotta pay the troll toll if you wanna get into that boy's hole. You gotta pay the troll toll to get in. You want the baby boy's hole. You gotta pay the troll toll. You gotta pay the troll toll to get in. Troll toll. What you say? Troll toll. Hey, hey, hey. Troll toll. So imagine my surprise and joy to find out he appeared in this random monkey movie that I was now being forced to watch. Spoiler alert, Danny DeVito was nominated for the Razzie for Worst Supporting Actor for his performance in this film. So if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know, fuck. The film also stars Tony Danza, who is a super famous sitcom actor whose work I'm not familiar with. But the fact that I immediately knew who he was despite never seeing his work just goes to show how famous he is. The plot of Going Ape is a simple one. Tony Danza's father was a rich and famous circus performer who died. And in his will, he said if Tony Danza can keep his three disgusting, dangerous monkeys healthy and alive for a couple years, he'll receive a $5 million inheritance. Meanwhile, some mafia guys want to kill and then later kidnap the apes so that they can receive the money. And the film is a series of repetitive scenes of the Mafia guys trying and failing to get the apes. Meanwhile, Danny DeVito is talking with some sort of thick Eastern European accent and he's trying to sexually assault some old lady. I watched this movie at one and a half times speed, and it was still too long. Let's jump into it. The three apes that operate as the plot device MacGuffin of the film actually do get into a bit of monkey hijinks. Not nearly as much as the bumbling idiots trying to kill them or even Danny DeVito, but they do their fair share of monkeying around. Let me just get this out there. I think the reason why this movie was so sour to me, and I hate to say this, is because I find these apes so fucking hideous. I really do. They disgust me. They aren't cute like Mike or Dunstan, and when they show their teeth, I kinda wanna throw up. I think my disgust at the sight of these apes redefined the genre of the movie for me. It's supposed to be a wacky slapstick comedy, and I feel like it would have delivered on that easier if the apes were cute. But they look like ugly monsters to me! So scenes of them absolutely fucking destroying Tony Danza's apartment don't come across as wacky, silly, monkey fun. They come across as horrifying! Poppy. Hey, what are you guys doing? Oh. Nobody's gonna stop you! I felt sick to my stomach watching this shit. Nothing about it was funny. It was scary. I had to double check that the film was listed as a comedy like five times. But then again, that's just me hating on the film because I found the apes ugly. Maybe some of you at home think these apes are hot as fuck and want their hairy monkey cock. And I won't judge you for that. So. What else do the monkeys in this movie do other than destroy an apartment in a horrifying manner? Well, 
They watch Family Feud. They evade kidnapping. They scream in fucking horror as their restricted body inches closer and closer to a saw blade. What the fuck? Ah, uh, fuck this movie. But yeah, the problem is that the human characters monkey around more than the monkey ones. The three mafia stooges get into wacky slapstick shenanigans in their attempt to kill the monkeys. Like falling several stories into a fountain like cartoon characters, or when the mafia guys fill the apartment with laughing gas so they can light a match to blow it up, and then Tony Danza and his girlfriend get into a crazy food fight while laughing, and then the monkey makes the gas go back towards the mafia guys, and they explode like cartoon characters. But then in the next scene, they're just fine, even though they should be dead. Danny DeVito walks on a tightrope and then falls off and then wears a maid's outfit for like 45 minutes. Going Ape is a classic example of a monkey movie that features humans behaving in wackier ways than the monkeys. And in my opinion, that isn't what I'm looking for in a high quality monkey movie. So, in terms of monkey hijinks, I'm giving this one a 4 out of 10. Now I know what you're thinking. But, Monkey, you're just gonna give the apes a low performance score because you think they're so ugly. Hey, give me some credit here, people. Ugly actors give good performances all the time. Just look at Adam Driver. But don't look too long. <laughs> so I'm not gonna judge these apes on the contents of their skin, but the contents of their character. And I gotta say, these apes don't do a half bad job. There are a few scenes where they actually do some acting outside of being crazy destructive monsters. For example, there's a scene where one of the apes pretends to eat Tony Danza's food and says it was good. I mean, I even made veal piccata. It's delicious. Try it. Good, huh? There's the aforementioned scene where an ape screams bloody murder about being sawed in half. And fuck, I don't know how filming a monkey movie works. Maybe it literally did think it was going to be killed in a horrific way, and the filmmakers were essentially torturing this poor animal just to get a decent take for their dog shit movie. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. In terms of monkey performance, I give this one a 6 out of 10. Alright boys, let's get down to business. Going Ape is one of the funniest, cutest, most clever comedy films I've ever seen. And I really, truly loved every moment of it. Oh wait, no, what a horrible mistake. I meant to say that about the porn parody Going Rape, about a trio of apes who have a little bit too much fun at a Girl Scout meeting. <laughs> this movie fucking sucks. It's a tonal mess, juxtaposing horrific murder attempts with cartoonish slapstick humor. When I watched this movie, I had to rent it on YouTube for $3. And those literal retards at YouTube had it listed as an R-rated movie. And for the longest time, I actually believed it was because it was so dark and uncomfortable in the worst ways. It turns out it's actually rated PG, which makes this the biggest mistake YouTube has probably ever made on their platform. I honestly don't think they were even trying. The plot of the film is that Tony Danza needs to protect these apes long enough to earn his inheritance. But the movie ends after like a week with the bad guys being defeated and the apes stealing a police car and driving away. What the fuck? They didn't even resolve the plot that the first 30 minutes spent building up. It's like they ran out of money and decided to end the movie 20 minutes early. 
And thank God for that at least. Even with fast forward, I don't think I could have sat through this shit a minute longer. Now you might be wondering, but Mumkey, how is this movie so much worse than something like Dunstan Checks In, even though they're both family comedies about wacky ape shenanigans? And the main difference that comes to mind is the villains. It's probably not the most important difference, but I think this comparison well articulates the differences between these films. In Dunstan Checks In, Lord Rutledge is a well-rounded character. He's cunning, quick-witted, capable of easily converting from a menacing villain to a seemingly innocent snob within seconds. He's charming and gives off an air of elegance which he uses to his advantage to convince Jason Alexander that his own son is lying to him. When he threatens to kill Dunstan, it isn't played for cartoony laughs. It feels like a real threat. And he never blows up in an explosion only to appear unscathed in the very next scene. He feels like a real human. So at the end of the film, when all his lies and tricks are revealed and he's defeated, it feels like an accomplishment. Like the kids in the monkey met their match, struggled to succeed, and ultimately won the day. Whereas with this film, the villains are one-dimensional, bumbling fools doing a poor imitation of the Three Stooges mixed with some sort of Italian mafioso parody. They're not clever, they're not fun to watch, their slapstick shtick has been done better a million times before, all tension is diffused when you realize these characters are immortal, and they're entirely forgettable. This isn't even advice for making a good monkey movie. This is just for films in general. Oftentimes, the sign of a good movie is how magnetic the villain is to the audience. And these mafia cucks brought nothing interesting to the table. And then the apes were fucking ugly, so I wasn't on anybody's side. Going Ape is incomplete, it's tonally confused, the apes make me want to throw up, Danny DeVito makes me want to throw up, it's repetitive as fuck, the villains are dog shit, and I don't like it. I give Going Rape a score of 10 out of 10, but I give Going Ape a score of 2 out of 10, giving it a combined total of 12 out of 30, tying it with King Kung Fu, a monkey movie that doesn't even have an actual monkey in it. And that's it for this second installment of The Monkey Box. Folks, thanks for watching my stuff even after I got yeeted. I wouldn't be able to do this job anymore if y'all didn't stick around. And I truly appreciate every single one of you watching this right now. This is what I love doing, and I hope you guys enjoy watching me do it. And folks, if we're gonna review every monkey movie ever made, we've got a long fucking way to go. We've only seen six of these bad boys. What will the monkey box bestow upon us next time? Will anything ever top Dunstan Checks In? Will anything ever be more despicable than A Wet Night? Find out next time on the third exciting installment of The Monkey Box.